Hey guys. How, How are you doing, doing, sir? Good. I'm Glad so to... sorry to be late. Hey. Hey, no worries at all, sir. Um, life happens. Life life did happen. But uh yeah, I'm just uh, about to my space and would love to uh chat for the time that you guys have left if uh you're up for it. Oh, um, you know what? I, I, I honestly, I appreciate your time and we'd love to have you come on and, um, uh, you know, time is everything. And yeah, if you're willing to share some of your time with us, I'm going to sit here and listen. Sweet. So, th so thank you. So, um, can you talk, can you talk now? Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, you know, you know, I didn't honestly didn't know a whole lot about Korean national farming. We talk a lot about on this show, um, different organic farming methods. And uh -huh. some of the people who come up a lot are uh, Elaine Ingram, uh, Jeff uh -huh. Lowenfield, and, and your name, is, it comes up. So I did some of the research in your videos, and you're a fascinating guy and uh, got a ton of knowledge, and, you, and you're one of those who share it. So without, without saying much more, kind of what's your story and how'd you get into all this? Yeah, so right now I'm on the big island of Hawaii. And I am doing a project for County of Hawaii. Um, uh, their research and development department asked me to jump in and redo a trial I did that one of their extension agents watched. Um, and we're doing it in a full on peer reviewable format so that, you know, they can kind of get some traction in the cattle industry, which is the biggest agricultural industry in Hawaii. But the second biggest is. Um, uh, macadamia nuts, which is what I grew or grow, our family grows here. And, um, yeah, we, uh, we farm 750 acres of organic macadamia nuts now. Um, and the process to become organic was, uh, really, um, made possible by natural farming, uh, for us. So, um, yeah, it, for us, it was a need as farmers to be more profitable basically was the initiation uh, of it. But um, yeah, somewhere along the line after we really gained a pretty good change in our profitability or, or at least a, an increase, a way to farm organically on an island where the inputs are crazy expensive because you got to bring it all on a ship. Um, we began to, um, I began to kind of believe that this type of agriculture um, could really foster and uh, make possible some of the systemic change that we're hoping to see in um, in the world. And so, yeah, that was that was kind of my journey to um, go from you know farming with it and and a little bit skeptical at first um, to uh, really seeing it develop in different industries and around the world. Um, and uh, really here in the U.S., is the driver, um, I've come to believe, is uh, kind of financial sustainability for farmers. And uh, so that's, that's what I'm seeing is possible. And, um, yeah, that, that's what happened on our farm. And we're still farming um, orga organically uh, macadamia nuts. I, I got a bunch uh, right here that I'm going to ship off to a friend. And, um, yeah, it's... Uh, that was that was a, a you know, ten years in in uh, two minutes. But you know that that was a bit a bit of blood, sweat, and tears. When when I learned, I learned from uh, Master Cho and his daughter. Um, it was pretty amazing that that all happened in my hometown in this little tiny podunk, you know, uh, place, uh, forty minutes to closest stoplight. And so I'm pretty grateful, and that gratitude um, has been a big part in me wanting to share and um, put out that information but i love elaine ingham yeah she she came out and taught me how to use the microscope again in my little podunk town and uh, that was a big help and then just the the knowledge the work she's done with successional um you know uh, life in the soil depending on trees and or, or whatever's growing um that was a big kind of key for me to understand what I'm trying to make with some of this uh, stuff for growing trees and um, and then really the tool in the microscope of how to assess 
the things I was making. So I did a lot of side by side trials and, and uh, a little bit of tweaking. And um, but yeah, it's it's something I've come to believe is real viable for large scale agriculture um, and food production in the U.S. And I uh, hope that it you know develops. What what a lot of our scientists have done is is really proven. Um, some of the concepts, but then a farmer has to try and take that knowledge and apply it as a uh, practice for agroecosystem management. And there's a bit of a disconnect there. Um, and so what I think natural farming is, is kind of an elegant method to, to put into practice a lot of these ideals and, and truths we've come to understand. So when you first started farming, you oh, were- Oh, sorry, I can't hear you. Oh, there we go. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Sorry about that. Oh, no. Hey, no worries. So when you first started, you were using more traditional methods and it wasn't organic. And then and, and, it, and you and you looked at it as a cost thing. And then it, and, and I'm sure the quality and everything goes up when it's just a better environment when you're going natural farming. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So growing up, um, we farmed macadamia nuts most of my life, last 30 years. And um, Growing up, I got to hang out and see kind of conventional process in deciding what inputs are going on, all our soil and tissue analysis, and then buying the products, you know, getting them shipped over in a container um, to uh, correct the issues. And, and um, really, uh, you know, that was a really important part for me of education, you know, like the pH is off. So the prescription is two tons of lime per acre you know, and that'll correct your pH. Well, 10 years later, after applying a lot of Lyme, um, we still have the same prescription. And I remember, you know, a young man thinking, you know, talking to my dad and kind of processing these, you know, uh, feedback we get from our soil and tissue tests and coming to find, you know, maybe not working. And, um, yeah, so I, I really value that um, kind of conventional ag education. Um, it helps me kind of empathize and know what farmers are dealing with in general and um, be able to talk to that, um, which I think, again, that conversation and being able to meet people where they're at, you know, farmers that are farming with herbicide and conventional, you know, um, salt inputs, they're good guys, you know, or, or women and you know, they're trying to do their best to produce food and, you know, so it's not, they're not the enemy as much as the people that really need help um, with a, a viable financial option to make a change. And so that's, I think, was important for me in my journey. Do you, do you what I found when I started going organic is, is things like soil pH or water pH, I, I don't worry a whole lot about them anymore. Are you muted? I hope you're not muted. <clears throat> I hope I'm not either. I hope I'm not either. I'm having trouble hearing you. Oh, let me, um, darn it. Let me, um, let me leave and come back and maybe that'll help. I don't know if anyone else can hear me. Um, hold on here. One thing. Can you hear me now? I'm going to remove go. you. And put, can you hear me again? No, you're back. Yeah, I can hear you just fine. I don't know what that was. Sorry. Uh, sometimes these things glitch and it's either I have to leave the screen or you might have to leave the screen. So, but um, I'll do it. What I was saying before is, what, what, you know, you talked before about like measuring, you know, having your soil tested and, and checking for pH and then trying to remediate that. Have you found that since you kind of start using these natural living soil methods that that kind of becomes a moot point? It just kind of takes care of itself and you even test for that anymore? Oh, definitely. Yeah, definitely. We're not. Um, yeah, IMO4 or liquid IMO, that, those, those kind of tools or, or methods in this natural farming system, which is basically just um, diverse indigenous fungal life um, and, and bacteria and yeast, kind of the whole um, group, um, they balance their environment, their living environment, they buffer and, and microbes like about a 6.5 pH. And so, yeah, we don't have pH issues anymore. And um, what we started having in our natural farming, we did 144 tree trial, uh, 144 acre trial for four 
five, four years. And what we started seeing is typically on our tissue and soil analysis, we'd see a uh, soil issue, a deficiency, and then we'd see it mirrored in the tissue or the leaf of the plant that's growing in that soil. Um, with the input of natural farming um, IMO4 and liquid IMO, we still saw that deficiency in the soil, but the leaf wasn't showing the same deficiency. Uh, to the extent that we had to have a conversation with our um, our uh, analyst, and he was like, what are you guys doing? You know, I'm seeing this discrepancy. Tell me about this orchard. And we explained what he was doing. And so um, the next time we did a soil sample with him, which was the following year, um, he had a little asterisk he added. That the asterisk was, unless there's high amounts of microbial life present. You know, it was basically, here's your soil deficiency, and it's going to lead to this t tissue deficiency, asterisk, unless there's high amounts of soil, uh, soil life present. Um, and so he had to, he had to basically caveat because um, the trees were able to get access to those minor minerals they needed, even though they didn't show up in a traditional soil analysis. And so, yeah, big change, big, big change in how we thought about it, too. No, um, yeah, <clears throat> I live here on the Pacific Northwest, west where the redwoods are, and in my realization was, you know, they're pristine when you walk through those forests. They're they're like you couldn't you couldn't create that if you wanted to. And nobody nobody fertilizes that. Nobody you know right. it's, it's just. And I started thinking, you know, that's what I nature nature works in its ways, and we we have a saying: plants and animals eat plants and animals. And um, that, that that's kind of it's a it's a carbon cycle when you when you break down to it. But um, w w there's a lot of them. What acronyms where they use letters in in in, in this field? And it's like and joining how, the army. It's like joining the army. And, and, and you met you know you mentioned a couple. I, I'm kind of coming up to speed on them. But how would you um? And I think one of your videos was Korean natural farming in a nutshell, <laughs> which goes well with your macadamia nut farm. What 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 are some of the big on that joke? What I'm um, yeah I'm not I'm not a good as the delivery. Um, what are some of the basics and fundamentals of 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 the idea of Korean natural farming? If you'd share that. Yeah, so it's kind of two parts, um, and I think the the two parts sometimes because of the learning curve with the one part, which is the microbial inoculum. Um, people focus on the other part, which is nutrients and solutions, um, kind of inputs for feeding plants. And um, in natural farming, that that uh, uh, microbial part is really the the eighty percent. You know, the eighty twenty. Um, if you have diverse microbial life and a whole soil system working, you're going to have very little um, disease issues and uh, nutrient deficiencies and you'll be able to, you can feed your plants for pushing that production and that yield but um but all, a lot of your you know um lack of production due to soil issues stops and so you have these really you know lush and vibrant uh crops just from that soil um being right and then the other part are all these um, liquid components, these ferments and tinctures that you can make um, as plant food. And um, so, yeah, indigenous microorganism and the steps to kind of get that from, like you said, the thriving forest to your farmland and get it established. And then these, all these like FPJ, LAB, OHN, all those acronyms, Oriental Herbal Nutrient is OHN fermented plant juices, FPJ, and then there's calcium, there's calcium phosphate, there's uh, potassium, there's nitrogen, and this fish amino acid we make, FAA. Um, and so based on your plant's growth cycle, you're spraying those nutrients um, as the plants need it. And it's a really immediate uptake. It, it can be taken, all these nutrients are, are really, um, the concept and, and the um, theory is all foliar, you know, really highly absorbable. Um, so in fermentation or chemical reaction, you get these very micronized um, 
plant nutrients. And these are all things, the idea is the farmer can make all this. It's not, you know, it's not a gimmick. It's not a, you know, I'm saying it's highly micronized. So I'm trying to sell something like I'm not selling it. You know, it's, it's really the, to come to a place where a farmer has returned to the knowledge necessary to um, grow everything on his farm and produce everything, um, I think we'd have a really cool change. And, and it might be that a giant thousand acre farm has to have a guy that's de- doing that full time, but compared to a fertilizer bill, um, we're talking pennies on the dollar. Um, and so, yeah, there's, there's kind of a nutrient mix that you can make and then a plant, it's called plant nutritive cycle is kind of the way and the, that you apply it. Um, and that's just um, the theory behind plant nutritive cycle is the right amount of nutrients at the right time. Um, and so that you're, you're not needing a large amount if you're um, targeted and, uh, and it's highly absorbed. You know, a lot of what we deal with in conventional ag is about a 20% uptake. You know, if I put on 100 pounds of fertilizer, I'm hoping that I get about 20 pounds taken into my plant for production. And then the other stays latent until it's mined. If you're completely void of microbial life, then often that can turn into a hard pan or create other issues um, in the soil. But, um, but yeah, in natural farming, we're thriving soil life and then um, on demand or really targeted plant nutrients. And, uh, you know, it's enough. Um, I think in our industry, they came out and they said, you can't farm macadamia nuts with that little nitrogen input. And, and we did. And, and then they, they came out and, um, and they wanted to know what we were doing. And they wanted me to speak at the International Macadamia Nut Society meeting. And um, yeah, so I think, I think the real way to move this ball forward is to show the success stories, to show farmers, you know, um, making more money um using you know uh, microbial life or tending to the microbial life of the soil for their kind of agro ecosystem management process so yeah it's it's happening um i got students in a bunch of industries that are just killing it and uh, as that story continues to unfold i think uh i think we can see systemic change and you know in our lifetime and and um, our kids can have new, good nutrient dense food on the shelves, you know, uh, is, is kind of the dream. Yeah. You mentioned, you know, a higher profits, but also a much superior product as far as nutrients go for sure. And flavors and, and all kinds of aspects. <clears throat> now a little plug for you. If, if anyone's interested in some of the things Chris talked about, he has an excellent YouTube channel, just search Chris Trump and, and he goes, you know, very educational on how to make like, FPJs, fermented plant juices, OHN, oriental herbal nutrients, if I'm correct. Now, those are, you know, if they want to learn about how to make those, I definitely would go to his channel. But let, let's look at, you know, I, I, I watched some of your videos. They're excellent. Let's look at OHN for a second and um, oriental herbal nutrients. And it's a process of, of making it right and fermenting, a, fermenting um, herbs, correct? Yeah, it, it's kind of like a tincture. It, it hails from kind of Japanese or Chinese traditional medicine. Um, it's antipathogenic or prebiotic type um, herbs, you know, things we understand are great for dealing with pathogens in hum- animal and plant systems. Uh, garlic, ginger, licorice root, angelica, and cinnamon. And um, and so it's, it's kind of a, it's a, bit of a health tonic, if you will. Um, But really, um, based on solid enzymatic theory, good science. um, And so that ends up being a bit of, um, you know, um, a little bit of alcohol, very, I mean, we're talking way down in the realm of homeopathy, you know, we're using so little oriental herbal nutrients. So if, for example, I make a 500 gallon liquid IMO, I'm using a quarter gallon of OHN in 500 gallons. So, you know, I'm using, you know, just think about it, 500 gallon tank, giant tank that me and 10 other friends can get into. And I have, you know, 
this much and people are like, oh, alcohol, you know, it's like a little bit of alcohol. What does it do in us? A tiny bit of alcohol. It, it, from our, our blood goes to our fingertips. You know, we, we stop protecting our core heat and our blood moves. Our circular system um, gets really uniform, you know, and um, yeah. And in, in, uh, you ever, you know, have the, you know, urban legend or kind of thing where they'd send a St. Bernard out with a little barrel under its thing if somebody got caught in a blizzard. And what was in that barrel was a thing of whiskey or, or, um, or brandy. And, uh, you know, and so you're like, well, how does that help somebody stuck in the, well, it's because the St. Bernard will keep you warm, but the brandy will keep you from shutting down all your limbs and, um, and cause you're protecting your core strength to stay alive. But now with the St. Bernard keeping you warm, you can afford to have your circulatory system, keep your hands from going frostbit, you know, because you're drinking brandy. And so it's, you know, it's the same kind of thing in uh, having that little bit of um, uh, alcohol in the system helps with nutrient uptake in the, the foliar applications. And it's just a, yeah, it's just a tiny, tiny part of a kind of broader system, OHN, but it's good. I, we, we take it when we got a cold coming on, we'll, I got a little spray bottle, hit the back of your throat. That's all I do. No, I got, I got coronavirus. Uh, uh, three, almost four weeks ago now. And I just took a little OHN. I had two days of kind of minor cold, but it was good. The, 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 most of the things you make are, are for human consumption also, right? So you can eat all of it. You can yeah. eat all of it. Yeah, and none of it will hurt you, um, which makes sense. But we're putting it on the things we're going to eat. Like it should be safe, you know? And uh, yeah, so most of it, all of it's good food. You know, I have a friend that wants my fish amino acid so he can cook with it. He wants that kind of, you know, uh, flavorful uh, fermented fish. He's going to cook with it. And, you know, that's my that's my nitrogen source. That's my uh, my fertilizer. And he's going to make it a part of his dishes. So, yeah, it's definitely a cool thing that I, you know, we can taste things, you know, and and then cooking, you know. I'm making farming with kids it's so, so great to be able to you know they can do anything with all of it and they're good and they keep them away from the ohn it is vodka based you know but. and so if i did my math right that ohn that was like a 2001 um dilution rate it's exactly right yeah so um if it ages right. um it gets it gets a little bit better but yeah 2001 is it goes a long ways and so um those that might throw stones at using alcohol, um, I don't think really understand kind of the, yeah, the, the tiny, tiny amount that we're actually using. No, that brings it up. Um, you also use seawater and, or fermented seawater, don't you, in some of your products? Seawater or fermented seawater, both are used, yeah. Seawater is really cool in that it has so many minor minerals um and yeah it's it's a it's a big deal in in um plant production to have those minor minerals available but especially for microbes um they they use those minor minerals in their process and then um, the plant gets healthier the healthier the microbial community is so it's kind of you know you, you kind of are you tending to microbes or are you, are you feeding plants you know you're kind of doing a little bit of both you're, you're tending to the whole zone of the roots and uh your plant um is going to look good because of it um one of the other videos that I, I found it real interesting and, and there's a school of thought where there's um between the the, the micro species in the soil and your in the plant root there's um there's kind of a currency of sugar that you know that current sugar is, is one of the basic energy forms you know the it's where photosynthesis starts or ends mm -hmm. and um mm -hmm. So there's, you know, so there's, you know, it, to attract the microbes to the plant, they, they offer a little sugar and to have an exchange of a, a, a nutrient of some type. Do, what's your thought on adding like um, sugar into the soil? Is that, is that detrimental in the sense that the microbes won't be searching the root of the plant? What, what's your thought on that? So, yeah, adding a lot of sugar in the soil, I see all kinds of problems with or, or an overbalanced amount of sugar, even on the foliar um, you're going to have, what's going to happen is your plants are going to get a little too rich. 
um, and you're going to have um, massive bug problems. Um, so one of the common mistakes in natural farming is um, people read something on the internet um, about like FPJ and uh, they think, oh, FPJ is good. So they make FPJ and they spray it on their plants and they'll have problems, uh, real, you know, pretty serious problems, probably crop failure because FPJ is a imbalanced nutrient by itself. But in natural farming, it's never used by itself. Um, it's used one, one to five. 500 at the minimal in conjunction with two other in inputs. So uh, uh, like a grain vinegar, um, rice vinegar is preferred, but any grain vinegar, and then a, um, the OHN. And so uh, grain vinegar brings in that sourness, drops the pH, and uh, the OHN um, facilitates uptake. Um, so FPJ is, becomes just this kind of like liquid compost, like a really uh, available plant food um, but yeah, we're, again, we're not, we're using so little sugar that, that it's, um, insignificant, you know, that's something that people that don't understand the natural farming kind of what we're doing are like, you're using sugar and alcohol. Like that's how you kill plants. And you're right. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a hundred percent in agreement, um, but not in balance. Um, and, and that's really kind of what nature does in those forests you're talking about um those forests and those communities of microbes in the forest have struck a balance um over thousands of years these microbes some might come you know a, a deer poops in the woods from another forest and a new microbes introduced or a fungi that wasn't represented there before and it gets established and then you know come to find out you know its role is actually needs to be way down, you know, at a very small operation, and it gets out competed by other things that are that are uh, making better agreements in the root zone. And, uh, and but it finds a place, it finds a balance where, um, and then all those diseases we're worried about are also present in there, you know, um, E. coli is there in large amounts. And, um, you know, these, these nuanced bacteria and even, even pathogenic um, bacteria and fungi, they're all there, but they serve uh, a role we don't fully understand, but they serve a small role in a broader um, community. Um, whereas if you have nothing, if you're blank. <laughs> if we're blank, <clears throat> well, I, <clears throat> Wow. Hopefully it'll come back. That wasn't me. I swear. I wouldn't have done that. So sorry if you can still hear us. Uh, yeah, you actually dropped out. I don't know if it was a connection, uh, Chris, but uh, God, that was awesome. information. hopefully he's going to pop back on. I, I, I have a feeling he might, but yes, I am glad I stuck around. That was kind of nice. That was nice that I did that. And it was a, a pleasant surprise. And, and um, what a, what a blessed human being um 750 acres on on the big island of hawaii yeah that's pretty cool that's something to, something to write home about i guess but um i don't know if he doesn't i was hoping i don't i didn't know how much time he had um but i was i was hoping we get to have some questions for him uh, out there i know a few people have some questions for for mr trump if he um pops back on but that was um I feel like um, a, a spring chicken after seeing him come on in a beautiful background. Uh, obviously, a lot. Yeah, you know, they're three hours before us, so so we're actually we're used to being behind the East Coast, but Hawaii's actually three hours behind us, I believe. Oh, let me drop. Oh yeah, let me drop the link here in case he's watching. He can catch it on here. I don't know. I don't know, but uh, well, that was a nice treat. I'm, I'm, I'm very, I'm very, very. That was very cool. Oh my god! Oh my gosh! Excuse me. Yeah, definitely. Um, if if it, if it, you know, he's, he definitely ha he's he, there. There he's coming back. That's good. Um, look at him. All he's all fancy now. 
<laughs> there you go. Hey, sorry about that. Hey, no worries. My so phone. what do we got here? What do we got here? So this is IMO4. Um, I'm making for a project that I explained for the County of Hawaii uh, Research and Development. And so this is around 120 degrees and um, it's got indigenous soil in it and some wood and some nutrients and uh, but a bunch of inoculum from um, from the local area so this will serve to remediate um, the the soil that's operating in imbalance and creating opportunity for um, kind of um, undesired production of plants so there's a plant called fireweed and uh, the county of hawaii spent um, millions of dollars trying to solve it because cattle is the biggest industry here and um and so we ran a successful trial where we remediated it just by rebalancing the soil using imo and uh, so they asked us to re replicate that trial so here's all my inoculum these are all um my microbes from indigenous areas. Um, I have them all labeled with when and where I collected them. So this is uh, an Ohia forest um, up on the mountain I collected uh, on 2018. So February 2018. Uh, and um, all of that, um, can you hear me all right? I can, so we're coming in loud and clear. All of that goes into um this process and we're able to um yeah we're able to have kind of an indigenous inoculum and uh this actually is super warm let's see where are we at here you go 110 so that's a really good temperature we're happy with that can you see that yeah i can and uh, yeah and then when you're really when it's a cool night kind of stormy day like i'm dealing with right now I can uh, pull up a chair and uh, stick my feet in it, and I have a little uh, sauna, you know, a little personal spa I get to uh, experience here. Let's see. We lost him again. Just as we were going to see him dip his feet in that 110 degree. So, yeah, I'm a big believer in grounding yourself in the soil, and I bet you that really will ground you but quick. Yeah, so I got a class coming up uh, at the end of the month where there'll be, you know, 70 something students and I'll make 2000 pounds of this material and uh, I'll bury them into it up to their chin. And really? uh, so they get a they get a full body sauna. It's kind of a fun uh, thing they get to play with. How about but, dust? Uh, so, so is that composting that will eventually cool off, right? So yeah, so the the way we kind of do it is we have a really controlled amount of moisture that goes into this. Mm -hmm. And so they are using, microbes are using that moisture to do their processes. Um, but then as they kind of work, they, um, they'll use up the moisture, it'll dry out. And it's harder in Hawaii because sometimes it's constantly being kind of, re moisture is being reintroduced just by the air but um as it dries out they stop having kind of things they can do with it and uh their the fungi will sporulate and in the end um this process we really we end up with a ton of fungal spores but also some of the other parts of the um soil food web we end up with um microarthropods and nematodes um that have kind of thrived in the edges because uh, the surface stays really cool and so, and it's tons of oxygen. So you have these um, cakes of fungal life that grow in the surface, the highly oxygenated, cooler, but damp and full of nutrients. And then in the center, when it gets turned, those fungal hypha get to a too warm spot in the middle of the pile and they'll say, hey, this is a little uncomfortable and they'll sporulate. And so they, the, the fungal hypha, the body of this fungus will push its nucleus into a fruiting head and create a bunch of spores, just like a mushroom has spores that come off their gills. Um, and then in the end, I have this kind of dry material that if I look at it under the microscope, it's like solid marbles, fungal spores. And then that's what I apply to my farmland. Those spores wake up 
And because they're indigenous, um, they self-perpetuate and establish in my agricultural system. So you just basically top dress it on the soil that you're interested in remediating? Yeah, yeah. So this will be applied at 330 pounds per quarter acre. Okay. And, and that gets rid of more than, it gets rid of the fireweed you said, or remediates it? Yeah, so so fireweed is a plant that thrives on bacterial imbalance. And the reason it shows up in kind of um, cattle systems is every cattle person, their grassland is their yield, basically. They're, I mean, they're yes, they're growing cattle, but really they're farming grass. And um, but the more impacted the pasture, the less rest, the more the cattle are walking on it and eating it, um, the more there's a, a slow kind of damage that occurs to the microbial system. And generally we get, we go from kind of fungal balance to slowly to bacterial balance with that pressure. And so um, I, you can't tell, I mean, really one, a really good system and there's lots of great cattlemen doing it is rotational grazing. And that allows those microbial systems to stay um, balanced and your grass production stays up, but that's that requires some infrastructure. We're talking major fencing because you got to divide paddocks and then you're moving a lot more. Whereas, um, you know, pat cows will just go roam in a big paddock and, and it doesn't need to be as heavily managed. Um, and so, you know, really, I'm not saying they're bad cattlemen, but really great pasture managers, they're never gonna have fireweed because they won't get bacterial imbalance. But what, what this experiment is for is to say, hey, could somebody come in with a liquid IMO spray once a year or a couple times a year and get the same effect of keeping that system um, balanced and uh, fireweed in a balanced system dies because it, it thrives only in bacterial imbalance. So when the fungus comes in, the fireweed actually gets powdery mildew, powdery mildew and starts getting hit by like um, uh, aphids. Oh, it's really cool. You, you watch the soil balance and all of a sudden um, fireweeds dying to things that like crops die to. And then going back to crops, why are those crops dying to these diseases? Well, probably because you have soil imbalance because you're working that ground and disturbing those fungal communities so something like this can go a long way to prevent disease and and increase plant yield so, so do you think that's some of the idea behind no-till is just to, to not disturb the the fungal hyphae yeah that's kind 100% of, a big, of it that's a big idea are you so i've, I've heard that before where you, you really don't want to mix up your soil because you're breaking up you're breaking up those which are basically increasing surface area your roots correct is that one way to look at the hyphae um yeah well so the generally beneficial fungi create really special relationships with roots and so yeah you're 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 taking away a, a vital component of the whole cycle of the plant like you said photosynthesis and sugars and, and sugars exist in agricultural systems because plants produce sugars. And so um, Elaine actually talks a lot about this and, and is a big, uh, yeah, she's someone that studied it. And um, But plants photosynthesize, take those excess sugars into root zones and create these um, kind of root exited kind of fields where fungi want to participate in that and fungi, um, uh, create a kind of symbiotic relationship there where they're bringing the rock that they're mining, the minor nutrients, and they're depositing in exchange for carbohydrate. And, um, and so these plants get on-demand micro minerals in their root zone passively. And um, that's why sometimes you're not, you know, in a really thriving soil system, you're not needing, you're not getting these weird lockout scenarios and not needing quite as much, um, major inputs um, because it's really cycling all itself in the root zone uh, due to microbial life and, and diversity. And also another thing of fascinating about plants is, is 
a vast majority of the of the uh, planet. I can't hear you again. Should I drop the call? Um, no, no. You want... can't hear me again. Sorry about that. Okay. Can you hear me now? I got you now. Yep. Just a in and a, in a quick in and out. Um, what what, what was that? What, I, I forgot what what I was saying. Darn it. I thought I had something interesting to say, but that probably not. Yeah. So, so this is in day three or day two of IMO four. Uh, I made IMO three for about a week, and then this will take uh, you know a little, a little about a week, and um, then I'll make I'll apply it. Um, like I said, at three hundred thirty pounds per quarter acre, we have a gridded out trial with that'll be randomized as far as which blocks are which, and. Um, yeah, this is actually something I talked about uh, years ago, and people have had a lot of questions about this trial. How did it turn out? And what happened is I left, and there was just a hiccup in getting it done. So I'm back here to kind of see it through, and um, and it was a bunch of cool things. We learned a lot in in the process of them working on it. But uh, yeah, this will be applied, and then we'll apply liquid IMO. And my hypothesis is that I can get the same results I've gotten before with just a liquid application, which would be a lot cheaper for farmers. And so um, we're going to do all that um, in a, um, I think it's four, I think we have a solid and liquid, a liquid only, a water only, and then a control with no inputs. And we have it duplicated and then randomized. And so it will be uh, um, all of those systems happening simultaneously in the same area, highly dense fireweed area that probably is really bacterially imbalanced and we'll see um, what kind of remediation we get and we'll be able to take pictures we're also going to do before and after soil tests so people can understand that this fireweed is not a weed problem it's a soil life imbalance problem and and even if that's as far as it goes just helping people understand what's going on uh, i think it'll go a long way to help them come up with real viable solutions. So what they want they, what they want us to do is they want us to create a business after we finish this where uh, uh, we're producing liquid IMO and selling the service of spraying it to farmers, but I'm not gonna do it. And uh, my student who would be really capable to do it isn't. Uh, so we're gonna have to scope out. So if you know anybody in Hawaii that wants a, a little leg up on a viable business, we're, uh, we're getting them primed for one. I don't think you would have to shout too far for that. Now, you, 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 yeah, I think yeah, that that should be easy to come by. Now, you mentioned you're working with the state, the state government with this project. Now, are you working with universities in conjunction with that, or um, any uh, professional organizations that are you know uh, writing pu papers on this and publishing it, or? Yeah, so this will be a scientific paper and it'll be published. It'll be published by me and my um, compatriot, one of my students and a really good natural farmer, Leslie uh, Nunjit. And, um, and then, yeah, the County of Hawaii, um, University of Hawaii Extension agents will be out watching this process, um, but they won't make the paper. They'll, they'll kind of have a a part of it, but they won't. Um, we're just going to publish it. So, so it'll be a peer reviewable study. Um, and that means that the university or anybody that might look at it is going to, it's going to be out there to be able to poke holes in it. That's kind of what, you know, like, Hey, you, you fabricated these, you know, you, you made all your, your, you know, trials on a pair area that had less fireweed so that it was easier to remediators, you know, those kind of things are what peer review is for. And, um, but we're, yeah, it's, it's, um, we did get, um, advisement, um, from, uh, uh, doctor in microbiology, but it was kind of like, yep, you got it. You know, this is what you should do. You, you got it lined up. Right. So, yeah, it is. It is a study. It is going to be published, and um, it, it's kind of what the what the county of Hawaii kind of demands up from that. But um, so, county of Hawaii, each state, each island is like its own county. Um, so it has a mayor, but it's it's uh, so it's not a, a state run thing because each island's kind of somewhat isolated and and um, runs its own stuff so this is county of hawaii or the big island where i live and then research and development is supporting that and they're it's so cool that they you know have kind of they, really kudos to them for kind of 
providing some resource to make this happen because I think it's a good step forward. No, I think you meant to touch upon it, how, how the, I'm going to use the blank term mycorrhizae system or the, the, the symbiotic relationship between the plants and the animals and the soil and the, the micro beasties. Um, I started, you know, looking in like, how, you know, there's not a ton of information out there. I think Rutgers University is one of the few places that is really starting to investigate this, but it's, but this, it's kind of, it's, it's a new idea, but it's an old idea. And um, I'm just, you know, like Elaine Ingram, when I read about the living soil or the soil web, is like it opened my eyes, but it's really thousands, millions of years old. And uh, we're, we're yeah, you're, you're exactly right. We're just partnering with how nature's already works. And the deeper I go into this, the more it's already a symphony. You go out into the, the wild forest and, and it's there there is a uh there is an orchestra leader there there this is this is a complex interconnected um machine of uh you know and machine's not the right word but just uh it's a symphony it's it's um it's all these variety of of microbes and organisms all working in tandem and in conjunction and uh, so nature, like you said, uh, the wild forest, nobody's fertilizing it. Nature already does this really well. So we have um, a unique natural environment as farmers where sometimes we got one crop in the ground over a large area and uh, that's fine. You know, that's totally all right. But let's partner with how nature, um, you know, fosters plant growth and um get the benefit of you know all the strength that already exists in nature and so that's that's kind of what natural farming is is it's not anything new it's not anything unique to you know like we got the secret so it's nature does this process and natural farming among there's there's other ways that it can be fostered but it is an elegant or a achievable um understandable method to put it into practice partnering with nature for a commercial farmer for a massive operation and um that's that's why i like it no um yeah yeah if you look at the example of forests they're, they're pristine and, and gorgeous and just just you could say perfect but we're not harvesting so so nature can do it all on its own but when you start harvesting from the land that's when you have to start figuring out how to re replace the balance. And, and I think, you know, yet we, you have to use some of these techniques. Otherwise you really, you know, if you never harvested an acre of land, it would, it would thrive, you know, you know, it, well, it would thrive or, or it wouldn't. Um, uh, one little, I mean, I, I agree exactly with what you're saying. And there's, there's a, there's a good component where um, it might not thrive. Um, so, say a place has been torched whatever and in hawaii or some places they use for growing ginger they use methyl bromide where they'll tarp whole acres and then blast a pretty pretty devastating chemical in and it's to kill everything it's basically sterilize sterilize the ground so that we can plant ginger in and not have root feeding nematodes and um then they leave and they never use that land again for growing ginger ever because it, it'll you know they're afraid of the nematodes they don't want to have a crop loss but it when you kill whole diverse structures of fungal life it doesn't just show up on the wind it doesn't just um magically reappear um you know some of these uh communities of fungal life um are are have taken hundreds of or thousands of years to all establish and find balance and so um so for um sorry my dad's bringing dinner i'm spoiled right now That's um, all right. the so so if the system has been broken if you've had a full die off in fungal life which i think is something we were encountering with herbicides I think in the orchard, when we did, we would do these small herbicide strips to um, reduce um, when we were farming conventional to reduce our mowing costs during harvest because we're harvesting off the ground. So get it bare so we can easily harvest. Um, I think we had a full die off of fungal communities. And um, 
because they're heavier, the wind doesn't bring them in. They don't come in with the rain. Um, so fungus need to be transported either by an animal bringing it on their foot or a bird and it's poop or, you know, some, some thing, but that's a slow process, really slow. And sometimes if there isn't some, some way that that's showing back up, you're not going to see a return um, unless you kind of help bring in diversity. And so that's kind of what this process is. Get that microbial diversity from spaces in your area. Um, teach the farmer how to collect their own inoculum to reestablish that diverse fungal community. And then, yeah, the whole system can, can the wheel can turn. So you even found that even that, I think these use that potatoes too, where they just sterilize the soil. Can you go back and remediate it and get it back living again when it's been, yeah? Definitely, definitely, yeah. It's in, in uh, so immediately you can get a drastic change. And then over three years of establishment, you have a whole different system. It's completely, it, to, for real complete systemic change in a torch system, I'd say it's a three-year process. You inoculate in the beginning, but then for it to really get up to speed, move into the soil, to have the earthworms come up to population and all of that, it's kind of three years. But um, but I can farm ginger in the same place year after year with no um, root feeding nematode damage um, because we're establishing diverse microbial systems and we have um, bacteria, predatory nematodes, fungal feeding nematodes and the predatory nematodes prefer the root feeders. And so if you have the system or the community there, then you don't have this runaway um, pest because again, the predatory, just like in Probably. Yellowstone, you know, the, the deer were, were dealt with by the wolves and the plant life came back. And, and um, so yeah, nature, if you partner with it is really good at establishing balance and that's what we found. That was, that was awesome, Chris. I appreciate your generous with your time. And, and, and if you have to eat dinner, I completely understand. And no, and, no, I'm, I'm eating dinner alone. I'm doing my thing, working and stuff. So no, I'm really, uh, I'm really bummed that I missed the beginning. I'm, I'm sorry. I was so late to the party. Hey, no, no, no worries. No worries. It's all about the finish. Um, I, I think there's some people who might want to ask you some questions. So I don't know if you can see the chat. I can, and I'll throw them up on the screen. If somebody has a, a question for Chris, um, fascinating, fascinating. You know, one thing that you talked about in one of your videos that, that I never thought of, which, which was also just, you know, one, one thing also about a living soil is it, it has living things in it and living things are mostly water. So when you have a real living soil, the, 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 it doesn't, you know, drought is not so bad because once when you have a drought, those organisms die off and they release water. So it's actually a, a natural way to um, re retain water in your soil is just by having living animals in it. And that's that's so that, that little light bulb off on my head. Yeah. Yeah. You get a real drought resistance that that actually that one detail is why. We were kind of on the cusp, like, should we really continue to spend energy and effort? We did a five acre trial. We had done a 14 tree trial and then a five acre trial. And, um, uh, okay. That's a great question. Anyways, we saw a drought resistance happen. We had an eight month drought event and that was kind of our tipping point. We're like, Hey, drought resistance is something. So that question um, was asked, what are the individual strains in lactic acid bacteria when we're making lactic acid bacteria? And that's a wonderful question. Um, Sun grown 707. Um, so lactic acid bacteria or so the family's lactobacilli and then there's all these different types. And then um, we haven't as a scientific community mapped every variation of DNA within that family. Um, there's a lot that we still don't know about the lactobacilli family. Um, but um, to explain this, I'd like to explain a term, uh, terroir. Um, uh, cannabis community is really big into terroir. The grape community is really big into terroir. Uh, the cheese, the cheese uh, um, production uh, 
industries into Tarawa. It's it's basically a um, a unique flavor that comes through fermentation or um, or you know in in the cannabis case plant production um, due to the individual or the unique microbial communities that exist in their area. Um, and so they say you can't make champagne except in Champagne, France, because it doesn't taste the same. It's it's a totally different product, and um, and that's a due to terroir or the microbes that are in their air and in their soil there are unique to Champagne, France. And so when they ferment Champagne grapes, they get this very unique flavor expression and alcohol production because of the microbes that are present. And so to answer, you know, which strains of LAB, well, where in the world are you? And that's kind of the point of that. And a lot of these microbial inoculums is your strain of LAB in Tennessee or uh, somewhere in the Midwest versus what's going to show up in Hawaii or Guam or the Philippines are going to be uniquely different. Um, there, there's going to be a lot of similarities They're part of the same family. But if we started pulling apart their DNA, we'd see, oh, these are cousins. They're not the same. And um, and so um, when you uh, one of the reasons we start with rice to kind of there was kind of a side question in there, like, how does that work? The inoculum, we start with rice wash water because rice wash water is a very poor food source as far as microbes go. It's very limited. It's it's not a lot of gangbuster stuff, and it's also hard to chew because it's a complex um, uh, amino acid that's in the plant fats of rice. And um, so your typical or your lazy bacteria can't actually process the rice wash water, meaning they're not going to show up in that container and start to thrive and reproduce and multiply. Um, and however, if you put milk out, I mean, we all know what happens if I take milk, I pour it in a jar and I set it on the counter for three, four days, right? It'll smell like death. It rots um, because any old bacteria can jump in there and have a lot of food. They can't all process it in a fermentation way, but they can start to putrefy the, the, the two fats that are in there. Whereas if you take that rice wash water now that could only have really been inoculated by the lactobacilli family because they're the ones that show up in the wind and can can deal with that very poor food source now i have this big culture of lactic acid bacteria i take milk fresh pasteurized or fresh period and give all this lactic acid bacteria that formed in the rice wash water first shot now they're too big for anything else to get established they're going to ferment into curds and whey. That's the chiasin, the curds, the cheese is the chiasin protein, and whey is the other protein in milk. And it separates nicely because lactic acid bacteria don't putrefy that. They ferment that. They don't even work on the chiasin protein. They, they thrive in the whey protein. And so then you pull off the whey and you use that for um, human health or animal health or plant health. And then you can take that curd that formed and you can make yourself a great cheese dip with some good seasoning. Or if you're not into that, you can feed it to your animals and they love it. And you're missing out on one of the best uh, cheeses you'll ever have. Before I go to someone else's question, one of the like the mysteries or the, the miracles of fermentation is is an example of wheat. Like if you just have wheat flour and you eat it, it's you know, you, you, you can't live. But if you but if you ferment it and make bread you can actually live off that, you know, it just mm -hmm. introduced so much more nutrition, that magical process of fermentation. Uh, yeah. that's, they're, they're finding what you just described. You can pull up the next question, but they're finding what you just described in animal production. There was this guy out of India and they did this, this trial with single gastric animals. And um, if they took their grain and just gave it to them, so they, it was a three part trial. The one set of animals, single gastric animals, would get just the feed. The other one would get the feed that was wet. That was the only change. Same feed, but they wet it um, and gave it to them. And they got a 20% carcass quality increase from wet feed. And then they took that same feed and wet it with uh, a lactobacilli family uh, bacteria, like a fermenting bacteria, and fermented it for 24 hours before feeding it. They got a 
um, 20% on top of the wet feed carcass quality increase. So with the exact same cost to the farmer of feed purchased, they were able to get a 40% carcass quality increase, which is huge. huge. I mean, massive. Yeah. And so that's just with kind of like you're saying, fermenting the bread, making the bread is a different for our gut. We don't have blades in our gut. We actually rely on the microbes to make our nutrients available. Um, what are tips for fermenting store-bought fruit? Ooh. Um, don't buy store-bought fruits. Eat those if you buy them, but don't do that for FPJ. Um, trust me. It's not, you might think, oh, but I know bananas have good potassium. I want potassium. So I'm fermenting bananas. Just stay away from that line of thinking. Um, sunflowers are uh, full of potassium, way more than bananas. And they grow wild. And they're going to have all the microbes present on the sunflower to ferment themselves. So you can make FPJ out of them. Or, or whatever. But if you have to ferment store-bought fruit, add a bunch of LAB um, when you do it because you, um, otherwise the only microbes that are present in your store-bought fruit ferment are because it was bleach washed, right? It was doused with weird stuff so that it'd preserve on the shelf. The only microbes that are present to ferment that banana are what was on the store manager's hand or the, the clerk's hand when he placed it on the shelf or on your hand when you picked it up or you know whatever it touched, and the, there's some funky stuff in there. So you get really weird molds that uh, happen if you're fermenting without their indigenous fungi, whereas or, or their yeasts and bacteria. Whereas any plant you harvest in nature, rich in nutrients, um, is covered completely covered in everything it needs to ferment itself. All right. Run boy seven four two six would leftover sourdough starter have any place in the garden? Sure, yeah, it's uh, got a bunch of yeast in there. Yeast is a part of soil systems. Um, that would be a good experiment. Um, so mix it in some water and water some soil and uh, let us know how it goes. But make sure that you water some of one crop. And that same crop is not not watered next to it, so you can have a uh, real answer on how it helped you. Um, can we add compost tea to the rice wash, then milk to create LAB? Um, compost tea to the rice wash, then milk. Um, so you can create an experiment where you do that, but you're in a realm of asking a unique and new question. Um, and in order to properly run an experiment, you want to do that, do it the other way um, and get some water and maybe nothing and do like I'm explaining, I'm doing with this trial where you have your, your crop, you apply the compost tea milk and you apply the LAB, um, you know, um, and you, you assess their um, production. Um, but compost tea, I think you don't need to really, if you have compost tea, just add it to your garden. Um, adding it to the LAB is um, probably, uh, and, and sometimes compost tea has a pretty good degree of variance, even from one batch to another in the same farmer. And so you might get some weird results adding it to milk. I, I really like the LAB recipe and I, I'd stick with that for that and just add your compost to the garden. Now, if you want to put a little LAB in your compost tea, um, I'm, I'm for that, definitely. Now, you mentioned earlier, too, about, about Elaine showing you how to use a microscope. How, how much of that up your game when you started doing that, where you actually started um, analytically looking at, at what's going on? Is it highly recommended? Um, I don't know that anyone needs a microscope. Um, for me, it was really important um, because when this came from Korea, my teacher, um, Master Cho, um, his, his whole name is Cho Han Yu. We use master um, as like a sir or a doctor or mister. It's, it's a term of respect. It's really important in Asian culture. Um, and um, so, yeah, he's, um, when Master Cho come, he said, hey, this is how it works in Korea. You're in Hawaii, you're gonna have to figure out how nature works or how you can partner with nature using this technology 
in your area. And um, there was a lot of failure in the beginning uh, when this landed. People were struggling to basically produce fungal rich IMO. And um, so for me, it was a vital key at the right time. Um, I was kind of grappling with the idea of, do I need to understand everything about this and fully wrap my head around the science and the why, or can I just buy a product that somebody else is making? And I did that. I bought uh, 20 tons of IMO that was pre produced in 24 hours in a machine. Um, and uh, it nearly killed five acres of trees because I, I, I introduced bacterial imbalance because there was no fungi in that material that I was buying. And um, that was about the time Elaine came and I was able to look at that material, realize it was all bacteria, and then realize with that information that um, she was teaching that I have a tree, which is somewhere between a hundred to one and a thousand to one fungal to bacterial ratio preference. So it needs a high fungal community, low bacterial community. And so, yeah, the microscope helped me do side-by-side -side trials to see what food source was going to give me the most fungal production. And that's what a lot of people use as far as recipe now in the US is they use that kind of the product of that side by side work, assessing it with the microscope. That's why people add wood chips um, to IMO that wasn't part of the original recipe. Um, but in Korea, they ac they kind of accidentally add rice straw. Um, I watched this, I observed it, it isn't in the recipe, but that's their modality or how they do it. And rice straw is a high carbon and it's a fungal food. And so that anyways, and, and we add humic acid. Again, it wasn't in the recipe, but it promotes fungal growth. So yeah, the microscope was integral for me, but I've also done some of the um, homework for everybody. Um, and um, I don't know that it's as necessary um, just if you use the recipe as, as a, I share how is the finished LAB used? Um, it's used at a rate of one to a thousand. Um, it's actually a really small part of the whole um, natural farming system. Um, it has a pretty big online presence in some kind of forum communities. The LAB is kind of the main thing. And it's great. It's a great tool. Um, it's basically better than most bugs in a jug you can buy. Um, but it is only bacterial. Um, so I would use it like if I was growing lettuce, I'd add LAB to my compost tea. So I had that balanced one to one that lettuce likes. Um, some people use it to prevent powdery mildew or knock out powdery mildew. That's what they're playing with in the wine industry. Uh, great production. They're using LAB for powdery mildew. It's really effective. Um, so, but it's generally used at a rate of one to a thousand in water. Would goat's milk work instead of cow's milk? Great question. Um, yeah. And, and uh, Ink Gangus, good, good name. Um, ink ink Gangus, I think. Yes. Ink Gangus, okay. Um, cool. Yeah, uh, we, we, uh, we need to uh, promote and, uh, and support um, women farmers because everywhere I travel in the world, um, they're the best farmers by far. They're, they're, you know, I'm not saying that they're not some, that, that the best farmer in the world isn't a guy, it might be, but um, just in general, the um, care that comes, kind of the superpower that women have to be, um, bring care to what they're doing um, makes for, for better farms. So yeah, continue to, you know, see that as a strength in our, uh, overall community. And I think we'll, we'll grow as farming, uh, in the U S but goat's milk works. So does raw cow milk. However, if you're using raw goat's milk or raw cow milk, you might not have to do the rice wash water step because that's coming out of the animal with your indigenous LAB present, because that's what's needed for the calf or the um, <coughs> baby goat, the kid. Um, there's a lot of bacteria, um, indigenous bacteria in it already. So it'll probably separate all on its own and you don't even have to do the rice wash water step. But if you're using pasteurized goat's milk, goat's milk then uh, just use the rice wash water and it'll work just the same. You can also, if you're vegan, 
you can use bean milk and it's um you can get actually a bean curd and whey that forms out of that and it's um really effective too no you you hit the, the nail on the head with this young lady she works real closely with green bicycles and she's um she's very great note and she's very interested and she pushes pushes the envelope a little bit for us and um she's kind of pushed us into this area of, of of looking into you but um you're you're right about that women farmers are awesome and we need more of them in the cannabis industry i don't know how much you deal with that back back over there but we won't we won't even ask that question but cannabis? Um, yeah yeah i i'm working with two 1800 plant grows in colorado a bunch of my students are really successful cannabis farmers using uh, Korean natural farming exclusively. Um, and, and everybody has their style. Some people will bring in a little of their favorite nutrient in addition to the natural farming stuff. And everywhere I've gone with farms, um, everybody has their, their slight variation that, they, that works for them, maybe what they have available or their favorite nitrogen source. So there's a lot of room. But yeah, I mean, I have... It's on my phone, but I have pictures of this, um, really one of the best proof of concept natural farming farms that I've worked with so far. Um, you know, there's some outdoor that's killing it, but as far as indoor, these guys, we built them a soil bed using cedar, kind of like this box here. And um, my friend Leighton Morrison helped with soil structure. So we did rock, sand, silt, and clay, compost, um, uh, compost and silt and clay and then compost and soil and then we inoculate it all with IMO4 and they've used only natural farming inputs to grow and they have just gangbuster growth and fuzz and crystals and massive plants with really pretty flowers and they harvest at the end of the month um, yeah I don't know about uh, I don't know if this is a troll question or not <laughs> No, you know what? A lot of people ask this because they're thinking of human health and they're like, what is the optimal thing I can put in my body? Yeah. Can I use breast milk, human breast milk to make um, LAB? And the answer is yes. Um, you know, that's that's all milk is, right? It's bovine breast milk, um, you know, and, and uh, goat milk the same. So, yeah, it's... Um, it definitely works. If you are using uh, raw, you may be able to avoid the rice wash water step. Um, you'll have to play with that. But that stuff's like hundred dollars a couple ounces. You better be uh, better be careful that you know. But um, yeah, no, I think I think that could be really good for human consumption um, if you're if you're looking for. But I feed LAB to all my kids um, when they were born. They got a little bit little droppers in their in their tummies to help them sort um, gut health and and they've all really done well. They It helps with colic. Um, if, if you have a baby that's really uh, always gassy, LAB is really good. But I'm not a doctor, so I am really just sharing my experience and you're gonna have to make your own decision in your own family and you can't blame me if you do something wrong. <laughs> you, you mentioned that you, 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 ended, you got COVID the COVID virus and um, mm. in, in, in what was it that you think helped remediate that? So, yeah, I used, um, well, I mean, I think just not just being healthy in general is probably what, mm. you know, why I had a really minor case. Um, you know, I'm probably got a little extra dad weight on me, but I'm not, um, you know, too, too big or whatever. But um, yeah, I just, so I put my OHN in a little spray bottle like this and fill the back of my throat you can put it under your tongue and i do that you know a few times a day especially when i travel but yeah i had a really minor case so thankfully i'm thankful for that i know uh got some people scared and um if my experience is anything uh, it's not really something to be scared about in my case i tell you um, what i'm gonna try to you've been more than generous with your time and and you got to eat dinner and and do that so we'll do it um, a question or two more and then uh we'll, you know we'll, we'll we'll let we'll let this gentleman in, enjoy the rest of his evening in lucky hawaii yeah, i think i think offering a position like well here's a business opportunity yeah you you you'll be able to that 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 would be fun to offer yeah well and i'm you know i'm uh, i'm teaching a class at the end of the month in boise idaho 
it is on, it is going. Uh, I have a bunch of returning students that are going to co-teach. And uh, the October or August 31st through, it's like a week. And that's really how I've seen that hands-on taste, touch, smell is the best way to transfer this knowledge. Um, online works, but it's really, there's this component where it, once you smell this um, going right, you'll never forget that smell. Your nose will never forget that smell. And, and there's, there's no way I can push that smell through the camera for you. Like no. you smell this one time, you got it, you know, and then you smell it going wrong one time. You, you'll never have any questions on, on how you did with your performance. So yeah, if you can, and I have a website, naturalfarming.co, and you can download a bunch of free PDFs there um, that it really, it's a, it's really simple. I'm not offering a whole bunch in those PDFs, but what it is, is it gives you a material list. So if you're just starting out and you're trying to figure out what do I need on my table to actually make this so that you're not got all the stuff there and then you need to go find a funnel or go find a strainer. Um, it gives you a material list, like get all this stuff together and you'll be able to make this thing. And, um, and then I have some, some of my favorite tools. I don't sell them, but I link them so that people can see here's some of the containers I like to use and tools I like. And yeah, it's just kind of trying to be helpful. Um, no, for those, for those who come in late, um, he has a lot of these recipes and, and very helpful videos online on his channel. So yeah, definitely. YouTube, YouTube yeah. too. Yeah. yeah. Just Chris Trump and. Yeah, I, I, I tend to answer questions too in social media, so people, and then there's there's a growing knowledgeable community. Um, is the KNF class comparable to Dr. LAD class? Is the LAD portion included and is it a recognized program for someone looking to expand to a micro crop? What do you mean by micro crop? So Elaine teaches a lot of the science of the soil. Um, uh, I think it's probably a great class. I've had the opportunity to go through it. I have all right before she did this online class, she did kind of a, a lecture class on audio and I have all these discs, you know, of her audio, but I've never listened to it. Um, you know, that's not because it's not valuable. I just haven't yet. Um, but I did get to listen to her and I think she's, she's a wealth of knowledge. She's definitely a pioneer. Um, and, you know, and, and got a lot of kind of negative feedback from the scientific community for what she was talking about. But, um, but again, that is a, a deep dive into how it all works, the science and um, how to assess things with the microscope and kind of leaves you with a community to be like a tech, like somebody that looks at soil and analyzes it and tells you what you got. Um, and so that's kind of it's a it's a science education. Um, what what I'm teaching is if you took that knowledge or that truth that this is how nature works, but now I want to apply it to a farm system. I want to manage um, an an ecological system with that science. Um, that's what I teach. I teach how to put it into practice in an agricultural system. So I love the knowledge. I spend way too much time reading papers and digging into scientific studies. But, um, but in the end, that can inform some of my actions on my farm, but it isn't, it isn't action items. It's, it's, um, it's knowledge, it's truth, it's how nature works, but it isn't action items. What we're doing in class in um, Boise in, at the end of the month is we're going into how to take this reality, a brief kind of go into how nature works. We have a full, you know, a half day in the microscope and analyzing our products and our soil um, that we're making. Um, and we do teach how to use the microscope, but really it takes two years to become, you know, proficient in um, identification with the microscope. So even when you finish Dr. Elaine's class, you're not a microscope expert. You're you're going to take time to calibrate your eye for what you're seeing. And um, but yeah, that's that's what we're focusing on there. We're focusing on giving people the tools to put into practice um, that science. Um, that doctor and me and Dr. Lane get on great. We we hang out and talk at some of the conferences we both speak at, and 
um, we we have uh, everything in common and no gripes. So that's uh, that's good stuff. Is she in Northern California or Southern Oregon area? Do you know where she's based out of? You know, she used to work with Rodale Institute, um, which is in Oregon, but um, she hasn't done that for a long time, and I don't know what her home base is. Do you ever make it any um, seminars in California? I, I have taught at several seminars in California. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Yep. Anything planned for the near future? Um, I am. So all seminars and conferences, basically the whole schedule of the year got clean wiped with COVID. Um, and, and that's kind of a bummer. But um, I am. There's Living Web Farms. Um, they asked me to do a like a zoom class um so i'm doing that on the 22nd and 23rd of august it might be free they might be providing it free i think they are going to share it for free but i'm going to spend two days you know two five hour days kind of crash coursing um so it's kind of like an introduction class of like a level one and then that five day intensive would be like a level two you know not the levels or really anything but it's kind of the five day intensive is all the hands-on and really kind of you leave with a real good understanding of, of what your parameters are and all of this. Um, yeah. Hope I answered that question. Well, I think you did. And if you're ever in um, Northern California, I'd love, love to show you, give you a little nickel tour around this area. I can where yeah. in Northern California. I'm, or, in, or what? I'm just South of the Oregon border in Crescent city on the coast. Okay. So, all right. I have a friend that lives close to there um, in Arcadia, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of, yeah. Um, we have, I think, one of the heaviest trees in the world here. It's 30, 30 feet across. Nice. Kind of cool. Um, yeah, James Neff, he's a good friend, and he's an arborist and hangs out in Arcadia, and he's a student of mine. He's a great natural farmer. No, it, it's an interesting area for agriculture, um, especially in the cannabis industry. Yeah, yeah. There's a regenerative cannabis cultivation conference, the science of regenerative cannabis cannabis cultivation conference that they host in um, Humboldt County uh, once a year. And uh, I was out there at the beginning of the year, January or something. And so that's that's just down the hill from you guys, right? Yeah, but yeah, yeah, I, I'm, I'm there frequently. Actually, um, part of my testing crew lives down in Arcata. Okay. And, uh, yeah, a very good indoor grower. But um, man, I think I'm going to let you go. We've been, I've been doing this about three hours now. Yeah, man. Yeah, this is a, a marathon. Uh, again, I'm so sorry. Uh, hey, thanks so much for having me. This, this is really cool. It was. It, I'm. I'm. I'm honored that you 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 popped on my screen, and um, we, we we love to learn in this community. And uh, yeah, thank you. And um, maybe anytime you're welcome, or if you're out in this area, you know Shango, a mutual friend, correct? Great yeah, guy. I like Shango. Yeah. Yeah, he, he stops by once in a while. So if you're ever out visiting him, maybe we'll have to go have a suds or something together. Yeah, I'm down, man. Yeah, that sounds great. And uh, yeah, I think, um, you know, we'll see how the world shapes up. But I'd love to get around a little bit, um, you know, coming up here and, and uh, make those those connections are special. We're, we're you know, we're it's a growing regenerative uh, ag community, but it's we're still small in comparison to a lot of the things we're up against. So I think it's important to have those connections. And a really interesting group of people. Um, I meet fascinating people, intelligent, um, creative characters all the time. So it's, um, yeah. I'm blessed. I'm very blessed to be in the industry. I'm not quite at a 750 acre farm in Hawaii, but Hey, we, we can all dream. Can't we? Yeah, well, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm sorting it all. Uh, I, my, my family is running it now. I, I left three years ago. I was coming back every six months and making all our inputs and keep the program going. But um, yeah, I, um, I feel great. By the way, thanks for the concern. But I only really felt anything for about four days, and that was about three weeks ago. So I'm good. I'm, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm healthy and happy. Um, you know, and sorting life and. But yeah, I think I'd like a research farm. That's that's I think where I'm going. So I'll give you a little part of my my dream of my heart. I, I'd really like to you know um, serve the community by answering some questions. I I think my mind works like that. I, I'm research comes pretty 
naturally and I like asking questions and I'd like to make this continue to make this a little more um, streamlined but also uh, accessible and understanding and Master Cho my teacher he said hey I'm getting older natural farming's not done you guys need to finish it and so um, I think partnering with nature to grow food is something that's an ongoing learning journey for all of us a couple things when, with the, the when you were on when you were showing Master Cho your farm really came across the mutual respect that you two had for each other and that that was very that was awesome just just that that, that, that came across and, and one last question for me did you did you get to meet neil, neil young uh i have not i've been down the street from him um but i have not met neil young um i i haven't but i also haven't like asked to meet him i haven't had like a Sorry, I have. I mean, I know that'd be really exciting for some people. I, I'm not like excited about it, but my buddy Poncho is a rad dude, and we farm together. Um, he's uh, he's a sweetheart, um, and uh, he's a great natural farmer. His little property where he spends his days now is um, really a, a beautiful paradise of fruit production and stuff. No, I mentioned that because you you interviewed Poncho from Crazy Horse, right? Oh, it's not an interview. He oh. he's my farming buddy. He's my friend. He okay. he lives out here, and uh, he really enjoyed um, doing this natural farming with me on our farm. And so when I had to make uh, you know, hundred gallons of FPJ, he'd come out and chop things with me, and we'd talk story. And uh, I saw him. I saw him here. He's he's doing good. Okay, great. Well, you know what? Have a great evening. Enjoy your meal. And again, my honor. Thank you so much, sir. You too. And thanks to everybody for your questions. And yeah, thanks for having me. I, you know, ask anytime. I'm happy to hop back on. You got some things you're thinking about. Uh, yeah, I'd love to give you an, an, an on time uh, interview one of these days. So. Hey, no, no worries. And that, that was just that was awesome. No worries. And um, Mahalo. Is that it? Yeah. Yeah, Mahalo. that is. Mahalo Nui. So uh, thank you very much is Mahalo Nui Loa. Nui Loa. Mahalo, Nui Loa. Good night, sir. Good night. See you guys. See ya. Boy, what a treat that was. I'm going, I'm, I have, I'm, my bladder is going, starting to hurt a little bit. Um, thanks for tuning in. Um, get a good night's sleep. And um, boy, this was, that was an awesome show. Um, I don't think I'll be able to sleep tonight after, after something like that. But he was such a, such a, such a generous individual with his time. And let me tell you, he's, he's one of the, he's, he's someone to pay attention to. Um, definitely check out his YouTube channel. Look at us. Um, and I'm going to actually, I'm, I'm going to look at even, you know, a lot like, you know, he touched on a little bit, but a lot of the stuff he does is very healthy for you. And he's in, in the vinegars that you can make, he'll, he'll teach you about that. So, uh, I can go on and on and I'm not going to, I'm just going to say peace and good night. And I'm going to end the, I'm going to click this end, end button. I'm ending the.